You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. I'm Jeremiah Morrill. As always, I'm joined by our co-host, Dakota Davis, and uh, I guess it, we got a special featured guest that y'all have heard from before. That's right. Today's episode features guest slash really co-host, Cade Coger. Uh, we are going to be talking to Cade about all things agriculture. We will be trying to dispel some myths and some uh, some common lies that you may hear about uh, uh CAFOs, uh, raising, raising any kind of uh, beef or other livestock, and uh, also about uh, GMO crops and uh, the, whether or not the, GM, the Project GMO Verified sticker on all of your food at Kroger, is that real or is that all just a bunch of uh, malarkey? We'll find out. Uh, this show is about our lives in rural Indiana. We're here to push your boundaries and make you think as individuals. Sometimes it will provoke you. Other times we'll make you laugh, but hopefully... You'll always learn something new. Uh, have to do our thank yous as always. Uh, many, many uh, patrons uh, picked up a new one recently. Want to thank Sean right. Rao for uh, for joining us and supporting the program. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, anytime somebody can uh, somebody can join, you can join at any level. There are some suggested donation levels. If you go to patreon.com slash boss hog of liberty, there's some levels there. But uh, kind of like the old priceline.com, you can name your price too. So if you like, you know what? I don't like them $5 worth, but I kind of like them two bucks. <laughs> you buy two buck chuck or support the podcast either, either <laughs> or you name your price and we'll take it any, we, at we any just level. Make it more difficult to do it that way. But, <laughs> but if you choose that $50 and above level, what do you get Dakota? If you get $50 and above, then we promise to give you a shout out at the front of every episode. Those folks are John Phillips, Craig DeCosta, Chris Lamb, and Christy Avery. We also have the tea chip stores. If you don't want to donate monthly, but you want to show your support for the show, you can buy uh, some really nice T chip um, uh, apparel, a Boss Hog apparel from T chip, and that is at t chip dot com slash b h o l one two or three. Uh, you can get sweatshirts, regular T shirts. B h o l one is where it's just you know that's your basic standard, the the cheapest uh, quality, and everything that we can find. Then you get up to b h o l three. Those are the ones that Cade's kids are making in his garage. But he has a <laughs> little little Knox and Cannon who yeah. operate in the cotton gin. <laughs> he he has a, a home gym now, so their room has just got even smaller. <laughs> at least oh, it's man. American made, right? They are yeah. good. I I I've been looking at Dakota's hoodie, and I've got uh, I got to get me one. I, that's my next. That's the next thing. You're gonna have to get yeah, the, the hoodies, the tea and nice. I got to get the hoodie. Uh, the hoodies are very nice. I, you know, there's just something about being able to throw on a hoodie whenever it's chilly outside versus or, having to put or on inside. a jacket or something. Yeah. All right. So it'll be story time real quick here before, uh, before we get into it with Cade. <laughs> uh, about a month ago, roughly by my memory, uh, I was, uh, I was returning from a 4-H uh, trip and uh, had, uh, had a bunch of kids in the car. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you all to check the oil in your vehicles, kids, because... <laughs> <clears throat> when when you have low oil pressure, uh, you'll end up disabled on the side of the road, and uh, uh, it's not fun, not fun. So it was a if, if people watched the Indy five hundred in twenty sixteen, they saw Alexander Rossi in the clutch and coast. That's kind of what I did. You fire the motor, you get just enough speed, then you stick it in neutral and ride down the rumble strips for a couple of miles uh, with the hazards on, and just just to get to a safe spot. Um, and then I called my roadside assistants and they dispatched a local towing company and I waited about 45 minutes. And then the, uh, the local towing company, uh, they never showed up. So we called them and they said, yeah, we declined that call. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Great. So, uh, yeah, there about a month ago, uh, as we record this evergreen episode of the boss, Harder Liberty, uh, it was definitely, uh, definitely an exciting time. So I'm sure you guys have all had similar, uh, similar peril <laughs> along the way. There's uh, nothing worse than having your car break down on the side of the road. My my um, brother-in-law called me. This uh, was about a month and a half ago, from my estimation at this point. Uh, he called me and he said that he had a friend who was uh, broken down in Dunreath and didn't know if I could get him give him a tow. 
I said, sure, I have tow straps for my truck. And I went to to get the guy, and I didn't realize that he was in a Silverado tw- uh, 2500. And I needed to were, pull were him. You, were you pulling with a Buick? I was, well, I was <laughs> pulling with it with my Ram 1500. And I was like, oh, I don't know how well my truck's going to do with this. Uh, in neutral, it doesn't know how much, <laughs> what kind of uh, transmission that thing's got yeah, in it. And I, so I asked the guy, I was like, how, where do you need me to take you? I'm in Dunreath. And he said, Charlottesville. Oh. <laughs> oh. I was like, oh. For the out of town listeners, that's about 15 miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, I'll, I'll best at least, I, can, I said, best I, I can do is Knightstown. I said, I'll at least get you to Knightstown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if my truck, it, if it's not liking it, then we're going to have to stop. And my truck, I, it acted like it wasn't even there. Yeah, it would have been was, fine. It doesn't I was know. Impressed. It, I mean, you're just pulling. Your, your truck can probably pull 7,000 pounds. That truck you're pulling weighed two. I mean, it is, you know, yeah. it, it, well, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe two tons. It's nothing. So, not a problem for your truck. Yeah, and as long as the guy there, wasn't riding the brake, there were a few times <laughs> where he hit the brake prematurely, and it was like you get a little whiplash. Like, you you got to stop. This <laughs> 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 is getting really <laughs> frustrated. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's fun. So yeah, I uh, there about a month ago, I went through that, and uh, of course everything's better now. But uh, just uh, just make sure you pay attention. Check the oil. Check your oil. Make sure you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, uh, you never know. Uh, put put a tank of gas in your car, check your oil. So, Kay, the reason I've been wanting to do this ag episode for a while because uh, I listen to Joe Rogan a lot. That's like one of my top podcasts that I listen to. And mm-hmm. he's constantly talking about how his grass-fed beef is so much better <laughs> than any other beef. And yeah. how he says it, it makes me him feel better, like it's better for him and it tastes better and all this other stuff. And I'm like, I want, is there any truth to that? It might be. That's not what I expected. <laughs> I expected you to go no. No, you it, go it, hard in the paint. You know, I want to because I, I'm not a grass fed producer. Um, ours are grass fed and grain finished the way that the way that we produce our beef. Um, the main thing I think is it's not a whether it's whether it's animal products or whether it's it's grain farming. No matter what it is. I don't think it's a good food versus bad food argument all the time. I think the majority of the time is simply where it comes from. Yeah. And then how, you know, how it was raised, how it was taken care of. Um, You, you you go to the store and you see this array of labels of things that are packaged, packaged and it's antibiotic free or it's dye free or it's GMO, non GMO. It's, it's all these different things. Organic, organic, non organic, you know, it's really confusing to a lot of people. And I think everybody wants to do what's best. Everybody wants yeah. to buy what's best for them or what's the most healthy. So the, the problem is that it, those things are marketed against people. They're marketed against consumers that just are naive to what they're buying. Right. It's kind of similar to um, if you go to around Chinese restaurants and you see, you know, they might label their food non MSG or no MSG mm-hmm. on there. And a lot of folks don't realize if, if that. If you remember Seinfeld, Kramer used to order his Chinese food with extra MSG. Well, MSG is just a, it's a, it's, it's a flavor a enhancer. And yeah. It, it's a, um, yeah, it, it, it is linked to other issues too. I get migraines. My MSG yeah. is, there are, if you have too much of it, it will cause problems. There are some, yeah, there are some folks that have and a, a, a uh, an allergic reaction to MSG, but it's not the vast majority of folks. And there was a, a huge hysteria I think it was in the 60s uh, with Chinese immigrants coming over and using MSG because it was so popular in Asian food. And then um, uh, some health organization linked it to people who were allergic to it might have adverse effects such as migraines. And then the public freaked out and mass hysteria ensued. People uh, were terrified to eat at Chinese restaurants and uh, so that now all well, the Chinese mean, you, places say Chinese no MSG, and you're, I, you're supporting communism. <laughs> <laughs> and remember the coronavirus. Tiananmen, <laughs> remember Tiananmen Square, right? Is the coronavirus still a thing at this point? No, that's been solved. <laughs> they, thank God they found the miracle drug. <laughs> it was MSG. Nobody, nobody <laughs> saw that coming. <laughs> yeah, so that I, th- I feel like there's a that there's a similarity between MSG and 
grass fed beef. Now yeah. people start started freaking out because oh, this new thing came along and the packaging it looks nicer. Yes. So therefore it has to be better for me. But uh, the, uh to me beef is is beef. Yeah. It, there's there's a lot of you can take what we're going to talk about today with beef. You can you can use it for GMO, non-GMO, organic, non-organic, um, hormone or versus hormone free. You can look at all these things and find uh, baseline similarities. And a lot of it comes back to marketing. It's the way that it's marketed to consumers. Um, it's not always in the best interest, but a lot of the times when you see these labels, it comes with a price difference. So your price difference is going to be, if you go to the store and you're going to buy grain fed or grass fed, you're going to see there's a price difference. That doesn't necessarily Every, relate to health reasons. Everybody's looking for a marketing angle, right? Exactly. So you're looking for a marketing angle and there is a cost difference, whether or not there's a difference in nutrition yes. or quality, yes. there is a cost difference mm-hmm. in grain fed versus pasture because if you need to have, you physically need to have more ground and different resources to rain pasture raised beef than you do if it's grain, which typically is going to be some sort of a feedlot. And it takes longer. It takes nearly twice as long to finish a grass fed cow than it does a grain fed finished cow. Right. And there are agricultural products where you see a difference in what diet you gave it versus, Mm -hmm. you know, Kerrygold butter, right? Sure. That you see, you know, that butter sells for five or $6 a pound, but it's all from natural grain or grass fed cows in a certain area. Mm -hmm. And based upon what those animals consume, they actually have a different color butter fat that comes in and that, that, that makes a difference. Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean that nutritionally it's different. Yeah. It just means that you have, there are different properties that, that give you a different result. Yes. So there are differences and there will be different inputs and that's, that's ultimately what you're paying for. Right. So the way I look at this, is you have choices, right? If you, mm-hmm. if you, if you want to have entirely grain fed, locally produced, you know, you pick the, pick the menu items you want to tick off the box. Mm-hmm. You're, you're making the decision of, I'm going to pay a premium to have those things come off the box. So the price is going to go up, but you have that choice. Mm-hmm. And you can also simply say, I'm going to take whatever, you know, whatever product got to market the cheapest. That's also acceptable. You have that, opportunity. Yeah. One is not necessarily going to be unhealthy or more healthy, right? Yeah. Same thing. If you have, if you're looking at a fat content in, in a product, um, you could have a really fatty cut Mm -hmm. of a grain fed animal or really lean cut. If you go have the tenderloin off of a lot raised, you know, you have the filet mignon off a lot raised cow versus, you know, I I don't know what's, what's real, you know, a, a, Shoulder ro- shoulder roast, I guess, be a little fattier, right? Yeah. So, and you could just because it came from one animal doesn't mean doesn't mean that you're gonna have that difference. Either. Yeah. So basically, it just comes down to what you do and don't know about the product that you're buying. And I think the best way to know something about the product that you're buying is knowing where it comes from. So no matter no matter if it's uh, grass fed or grain fed or organic or non organic or GMO or non GMO, if you know where that animal can come from the best way to go about it is to find it locally you know cut the middleman out cut it cut the transport as long as it's something that you can find that you know the person that produced that that animal or that crop um, i think that's going to be your best route as far as that goes because you have the expectation or the understanding of you don't have that supply chain in the way right sure and it's it's not going to work it's not going that's not going to be even that's not going to be the best option every time because i i wouldn't sit here and say that Every animal producer out there does things the right way. You know, not every animal producer does it, but just be, just because it's local doesn't make it good. Exactly. So definitely try to know where it comes from. You know, I try to put myself out there um, with my farm. I try to connect with as many people as possible. Um, I have people message me all the time to ask me questions about the things that we produce and sell, and I do my very best, you know, to keep them updated and and on my own social media feeds. If I see an opportunity to take a picture and explain, you know, this is how this works or this is what we're doing today um, with these crops or with these animals, I try to do my best just to be an advocate for agriculture. So if we're looking at the the economy of scale on some of this, Mm -hmm. everybody can't afford to spend 
uh, I don't know what's the what's the going rate of of a pound of of ground beef at your place is it four, four bucks a pound yeah four fifty somewhere yeah. in there yep um so not everybody has a beef budget sure and if you are having a beef budget maybe not everybody can necessarily afford to pay the thirty percent premium that you would have over you know the local grocery store mm-hmm. um the reality is is to get everybody fed there's a place for the commercial, the larger commercial operations yeah, as well. So sustainability is, is the word that we hear as producers. Um, when we're looking at producing these, you know, whether it's crops or animal agriculture, what we're looking at is sustainability, you know, supply and demand, what can we raise? And then what are we looking at in the future? As far as world populations go trade deficits, everything else, what can we do with what we have to maximize those efforts? And also at the same time, we're trying to maximize our own value, our own dollar that we're putting into the production of these things. So is what's your bottleneck? If you're looking at your business, is it, I can only fit, we'll say 300 cows on a property. So I can 300 is what I could do. Or is it, I can't, I can't move that much product at the, at the unit I need to sell it at. So that's the, that's the cap we have or what's, what decides how big a farmer gets? Um, I mean, for us right now, we're still depending on <laughs> depending on on uh, who you talk to, uh, <laughs> which one of the which one of the guys you catch. Yeah, well, we're still we're still a family farm. We're still family owned, family operated. You know, we employ some guys, but the scale that we operate, um, as far as things go, some people would consider it a commercial size farm. Um. The truth to that is modern day farms are average. I, I would say we're just an average size family owned and operated farm nowadays. Um, as, as technology has progressed, it's made it easier for us to handle more acres and more animals um, and with less help. But we're at the point where if we want to expand, uh, we can use more help and more acres. So, so it's a, we don't know. It, you know, it could, it could grow, grow bigger. It's just, it's all a matter of survival well, and what works for that. The farm. markets themselves are just so volatile. I right. mean, basically any move you make is going to be, nothing is ever for sure. Any move that you make is going to be a gamble. Right. So like we just got, we just got finished building our second um, newer style feedlot. And, you know, the markets right now, as far as beef goes, if you're selling commercially, it's just not, it's just not great. The outlook doesn't look great, but you know, we're hoping with these new trade deals that are coming up here in 2020, uh, we're hoping we'll see a lot more world trade going on this year than we did last year. So do, do you feel like as a, as a producer, the beef, beef market has slipped, the pricing slipped over. Yeah. Here we the, had it was like 10 years ago, it seems like we killed off a hell of a lot of cattle and yeah. pricing dropped way down. Yeah. And then after that, then it skyrocketed back up. And that is that the number you're looking at? Well, that peak it, we had seven or eight years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's not, and it's not just the beef market. I think every market, um, the dairy, dairy market especially, has has seen a, a pretty big decline. Um, but really, all the commodities across the board the last couple of years, they've not been great. But you know, profit is there. Um, so we're just hoping to see more more trading activity with some of these new trade deals we have going on. So you're listening to the Boss Art of Liberty podcast on the Wall Network. Uh, Jeremiah Morrill, Cade Coger, and uh, co-host Dakota Davis talking uh, talking about beef pricing and, and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. What what I wanted to get to get into on this was to many it's it's a matter of trying to turn feed into into meat, right? You're turning mm-hmm. you're turning grain into meat for the most economical price possible. Yep, input output, and that's why a lot of the the CAFO or whatever the correct term is now confined feeding animal operations, whatever you pick the alphabet soup that applies, Mm -hmm. but that's why those have made sense. The farms get bigger and that's where you can most efficiently turn that corn or soybean into pork products or beef products or poultry products. Mm -hmm. So the scale's gotten bigger, but there may, I don't know if those are the most targeted or if that's, I think why, why they get why they get the bad rap. So I think when people um, from people from outside the industry look at, I mean, I guess here we're talking specifically animal animal agriculture. Uh, when they look at uh, confined feeding operations, they see the bad. They see animals that are in small spaces that are kept there. Um, they always try to make it seem like those animals aren't well taken care of. That they're always sick. 
and the uh, people that take care of them barely the pe- speaks English, and obviously those cows know English, yeah. so yeah. they have to be spoken so, to in and English. So you, you, you hear CAFO along with terms like factory farms, and it's normally it's from people that have no experience around them. They have cranes that just come in and pick up all the dead ones and put them in the incinerator <laughs> yeah. every day. I've yeah. seen a lot 10, of 10 or videos. 15 dead cows. So the thing, the thing that's, that's never mentioned in those conversations, especially when there's no farmer around you know, that has any information with what's really going on is the, the health and nutrition of those animals that are, they're confined so that we can keep a closer eye on how well those animals are, are staying healthy. I mean, it comes down to we're monitoring pH levels in their gut biome. Well, we want the feed that we're feeding them to be digested and, and, and them to be able to gain weight at a fast enough rate that we can make a profit at the end without that animal being sick, um, without it getting any type of injury, uh, without it spreading any type of injury throughout the herd. Um, so having them all in one area where they have access to fresh water, fresh feed, dry bedding. Um, and then we, we can, and at our facility anyway, we have a dry discharge. So their manure, as they, as they use their bedding for manure, we, we stack straw, dry straw on top of that. And then we can haul that out and spread it on, on our crops to grow with corn and beans for next year. But when it comes down to it, we're taking very, very close care to these animals health. I mean, there's not, there's not a, there's not a, uh, a feed calf in the, in the barn that you can go into and they don't come up and they're excited to see you there. They're excited to see you there to feed them. They, some of them, they act like dogs and people would have you believe that they're just terrified of people and they run at the side of you. And yeah, it's the, the difference that they all have different personalities, right? Yeah. Some of them want to come up and rub on you and see you <laughs> yeah. and yeah. love on you and others. Yeah. And I mean, we don't want, they're just like any other animal, right? Yeah. And as a producer, they all have personality as a producer, you know, it's one of the things that I really love the most about agriculture is, is working with animals. And it's what I liked most, you know, going through 4-H learning about animals and animal agriculture and seeing it, you know, as we've progressed with it as a farm family and, uh, you know, cow calving season is probably one of my favorites is we get to help. It is Snapchat gold for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> so if, you're what, my fr- if you're my friend on Snapchat, <laughs> you get to see live births all the time. So, so. It, we're coming up on that time of the year now. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's your Snapchat? People yeah, want to add just, you up. Just Cade Coger. Just Cade Coger. Uh-huh. Not farm, c- farmer Cade or anything. Yeah. Just Cade Coger. Just Cade Coger. All those Ks. Yep. What, so. what's, uh, what are the birth dates ranging from? You, can cows be born at any time of the year or do you target spring? Yeah, we target spring, February, February to April. Uh, we do our best to kind of get everybody in at the same time. That way the breeding cycle for the next year, we can turn the bulls out on the cows and have now, calves all in the same area. Are you the, um, are you the bull or do you have real life bulls running around? No, we've got two real live bulls. So we don't do any artificial insemination. We have in the past. It's, I don't have anything against it. I mean, I think it's a good way for farmers to get, to get uh, good genetics in their herd. I mean, do you have but, GMO bill, bulls? What are you trying to tell me? No, no. We just, we, we have real life bulls, but <laughs> sometimes people, artificial insemination, uh, you can buy, you can buy semen and just buy straws of bull straws. Yep. And, and turkey uh, basers. Yep. You can do it yourself or have the vet come out and um, you can have your, your cows bred. Do you, when you hand. would do that, which is that to bring a little diversity in the herd. You kind of go through a catalog and pick something. Yeah. It's, that's, uh, I know on the dairy side and on the hog side, a lot of folks will go through and say, Hey, I need to fix these three faults or these are the things sure. I want to work on. So this is what I want to bring into the herd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can use it that way. I mean, it's really operation dependent. We've got enough space and enough pasture for our cows that we can afford to have a couple bulls on hand. Um, and then there again with the bulls and the cows, we take just as much care of them and their health. They've got to be, healthy bulls to breed and we've got to have healthy cows to have them bred and then take care of cow or the calves when they do have the, cows. why did you decide to go with having live bulls on site versus artificial insemination? Uh, it's just, it's just how we've always done it and we've got the room for it's it. It's a so. Henry County farm yeah. and it's the way they've always yeah. done things. So that's yeah. the way they're going to do things. <laughs> yeah. It worked 40 years and, ago and it works today. I mean, for, for us, um, the herd of our size, it's cheaper to do it that yeah. way than it is to buy straws and, and artificially inseminate all of them. Yeah. There's stuff happening. I don't know what, is there a tornado? <laughs> Spring tornadoes are happening. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, have I missed anything? I'm sure we, we went over a lot there in a short period of time, but no, it makes sense to me. I mean, so I went, uh, I was doing my research before the show and, uh, I can't see that corn existed 
400 years ago. Mm -hmm. So why do you, uh, why do you raise this mutant crop? So you hear people talk about grass fed all the time, right? Yeah. Corn is a grass. What? Boom. Mind blown. (laughs) Next thing you know, you're going to tell me tomatoes are fruit. But no, it it comes down to, like I said, when we talk about their gut biome and how they're able to digest uh, the inputs, the hay, the corn, the the roughage, the forage, everything that we mix uh, for their daily feed rations, uh, we're paying attention to how well they're digesting that that food. If it's if it was something that was unhealthy for them, they would not stay. They would not remain healthy. Right. They wouldn't uh, gain weight. They wouldn't stay. Exactly. They would. They would get the sniffles. Yes. There would be issues. Yes. So, and every, oh, every. I think it's every other year, or maybe every two or three years. Uh, we do a lot of our uh, nutrition program through Purina, and uh, they'll bring us out to St. Louis to their to their research and development farm, where they'll actually show us when they're developing uh, feed rations for cattle. Uh, they'll show us the test animals that they're using. Um, they'll show us the tests that they're actually performing for how they're how they're getting all of this information to come up with the science behind uh, the food rations that we're giving our animals. So it's as a producer, it's fun to go and see the 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 live action science of how things are actually being handled, you know, through a corporate standpoint and how they provide products for us to help our, our end result of producing the best beef that we can. Hmm. And so with that, I'm, I'm sure that you've had grass fed beef. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there's a taste difference between grass fed beef and your beef? I think it's beef. Yeah. I've never, <laughs> I've never noticed. The no, taste difference. I, I, I can't say that I could, you could put two steaks down next to each other and I could taste one and taste the other and tell you that there's a difference. But, by looking at it, I might be able to tell you. Yeah, because I think some, I think my grain my grain fed beef has a little more fat marbling in it. Yeah, for sure. Especially if you're getting a fattier cut. Yes. Yeah. So I think there's a lot there's a lot more fat there um, because they're they're given a wider variety as far as their diet goes. It's a more complete. They're getting fat. They're getting more fat, right? Yes. If you're if you're just eating grain, that's why it takes longer to put the weight on as well. Yes. Is it's almost like you're you're building. Your, your building blocks are smaller, right? So yes. if, if you're, if you're baking a cake or you're, you know, whatever you're, you're icing a cake, you're doing it slower, right? Yeah. Instead of putting on thicker layer, just like painting a house, same thing. It's how thick do you apply something? It's the same deal with, mm-hmm. with grain fed versus corn fed. Mm-hmm. You're still going to get to the same spot, mm-hmm. but uh, it's going to happen a little, little differently. So it's going to be leaner all the way through. Yep. Yep. That's the way it seems to be working, but it may, you know, you may notice more of a difference by the way you cook it. Right. Yeah, if you if you use uh, you, you microwave it versus using the grill, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have a different yeah, flavor, yeah, little flavor profile. I like to do a little reverse sear, and then finish. The reverse it sear is where it's at. Yeah. So that's, you don't get that's where meat. that's where you put it on defrost for 20 minutes, and then you take it out and you uh, you put it on microwave mode. That's the reverse <laughs> yeah. sear, right? And then you and then you take it out and you uh, stick it right on your electric stove top mm-hmm. and get that nice caramelization. So if, if somebody <laughs> has, uh, you know, somebody normally goes to the Kroger or Aldi or Walmart and they normally buy their beef there. Um, what, how is the experience different if they come to a, a local grower, a local producer and you guys have your stand on, on state road three on the North side of town, mm-hmm. do they show up and say, Hey, I just want hamburger or do they, do you have a counter where they see the meat and you pick it out? How does, how does that experience work for a customer so, and what should they expect? Well, Unfortunately for us, uh, there's a lot of uh, government malarkey when it comes to selling our own beef products like that. Uh, it's not like a typical deli that you walk in and you see all the red meat behind the, the counter. Everything that we have is already cut, it's already packaged, and it's already frozen. And that's because the law says that that's how you have to do it's it. It's just the red tape that we have to go through as far as being able to legally sell it. So everything we produce is produced here in the county, Henry County. Everything that we take is butchered and processed at Matty Moose, which is still in Henry County. And then after it's packaged and frozen there, it's brought back and we've got a cooler um, at the produce stand on three. And uh, we keep it in a big cooler out back in the barn. And then when you, you come in and you say, I want this many pounds of this steak or I want 
you can say you want quantities of steaks and they are, they all weigh different because the way that they're cut. Sure. And then everything's just weighed to, uh, the price and then you pay for it there. So, so any cut, pretty much any cuts available or how does uh, that, would- there's, there's a few cuts that we don't have. I wish we did have, I wish we had brisket. Um, it's just a big cut. It takes a lot. It just takes a lot out of one animal to be able to sell that one piece versus right. many pieces. So you, you can, you're going to sell it all. So you cut yeah. it up in a way that gives so, you the most marketable. Yes. We have, versions. we have all the popular steak cuts. Uh, we have ground beef. We have uh, ground beef that's already in patties. Uh, we have cube steak. Uh, we've got roasts. You have ribeyes, rib New York strips. Yep. New York strips. Sirloins. Sirloins. Filet mignon. Yep. I've had your, um, I've had the ribeyes, the New York strips, and the sirloins. I, I personally, I love New York strips and I love ribeyes. Um, New York strip is, I, I like it because of the fat cap that's on it. Mm-hmm. But I really like fat marbling that's inside of a ribeye. Mm-hmm. And it just depends on how you cook them too. Yeah. But so, what's your go-to if you're gonna you're gonna go get a steak, and you're gonna feed the family? What's the cut you go for, and how do you like to prepare it? I think I think I would say. If I had to grab one out of the freezer right now, I'd, I'd probably grab a ribeye. Uh, a little I, fattier. Yeah. Well, they're, they're a little fattier, but it's closer to the bone. I wish I wish we could cut them as tomahawks. Have you seen the tomahawk yeah, ribeyes? Yeah, yeah. I wish we could cut them as those just for the presentation of it. I've been doing a lot of cooking on my Traeger here lately, and I'll – I'll cook something that real would nice. Be really cool. I mean, I, I, get, I feel like you know a guy. You probably can have a couple done custom. So that <laughs> yeah. you can have some of these, yeah. Yeah. these boutique items available, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, but, we'll label the the the, uh, the boss hog collection down there at L and K. Yeah. Well, we might have to charge a little extra for it. Yeah. Brisket yeah. and tomahawk ribeye. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. it could be done. Yeah. If I had to pick one, it'd probably be ribeye. And we can like I said, I'd reverse. I'd reverse sear it. Start dry aging beef down there. And you know, then, that's, then you can that's been like, one thing I've not had any experience with is how much or my, how well to dry age. My first, I had my first dry aged steak at, um, at Sullivan's Steakhouse uh-huh. in India. I had a dry aged New York strip. That is different. Yes. It was, I think it was worth it. I don't know if I'll get it. We're going again here in a couple of weeks and I don't know if I'll get it then. Yeah. But uh, it was for the experience. It was cool. Yeah. I think I've tried two or three dry aged and it's, it's, it is, it's just a little just, bit. Different. There's no real way to explain it. Nutty, I guess it like, it, would be, it has almost a jerky feel to it. Like, a, yeah. like the top layer. And it's got the, a, like a aftertaste funk. That's yeah. kind of similar to like a blue cheese aftertaste. Funk. So they, one of the reasons why it costs so much, obviously there's more labor that goes into it, but mm-hmm. you also have waste because you're drying it out. So you're actually losing. Yeah. You have a to big cut it portion. Off. Yeah, yeah, you're losing a big portion of the meat. So it's controlled rot. Right. So if you had if you had two pounds of meat there and then you had a, a pound rot off, you still have to pay for the pound you didn't consume. Yeah. yeah. So now obviously your cost is double or triple or four times what it would have been. I only got it because it was that was their special that night. Yeah. So it was it was like I think it was fifteen dollars more than the other steaks, and I was like, Yeah, eh, it's a special occasion. So Sullivan's you, is good. They've always got good steaks. Do you ever have yeah. any of the um, the local restaurants come to you looking for L and K products? Is that has it ever been a relationship where they've tried to come say, "Hey, we want to have brand your beef"? I know we're, the folks in Greenfield have done that a lot. Yeah, uh, we're Tyner, we're selling Tyner our Pond our group. steak burgers at Sparky's Doghouse now. We have been for the last I think two years. Really? So and those go over well. We went. They went from. I think I think they said they tripled their steak burger sales when they started taking ours. Wow. So, I mean, we're in there once a week with a, with a order for steak burgers, huh. but yeah, we'd, we would definitely like to expand that. If there's anybody listening that has an establishment that they would like to serve locally raised and produced beef, we'd be interested in talking to you. The steak, uh, the steak sandwich is a Henry County staple. Yeah. Every bar has to have a steak sandwich that at least rivals the one at the ice house. Mm hmm. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is in about Henry County. So yeah, Indiana is known for the pork tenderloin, which mm-hmm. is a, which is literally a pork loin yep. cut up, That's pounded out, beaten into beat, beaten <laughs> a millimeter thick, beaten then, super thin and then breaded and then fried and then served on a sandwich. If you're listening, suspend your disbelief if you're listening from outside of Indiana, but that's what we do. It's like a schnitzel, but we call it the Indiana pork tenderloin. Also popular in Iowa, but we beat it thin. You deep fry it. It's covered, you know, and then it's served generally on a it's bun. It's a, a with, novelty thing. 
lettuce, tomato, mayo, and onion, and maybe some pickles. They're mm. not that tasty. I think they're pretty good. I just, I feel like it tastes like oil that it's fried in and whatever condiments you put on it. It's fine. It tastes good. Yeah. But it's now, not like a... Now, kind of mm, like there's I'm two Pizza Kings... got king. a for tenderloin. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like there's two Pizza Kings in Indiana. There's also two different ways to do tenderloins as well. Yeah. You can have one that's pounded out super thin. It almost feels like it's processed thin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it can have the one that's still got... It's almost like a pork chop. Like I a like, fried pork chop. Yeah. And I that's like what I like a little ones. better. If they're meaty like that, then I like them. Yeah. Pound it out, you can miss me with that. Yeah. Like you don't, you, don't, need, you ones. don't need one that's the size of a football. No. No. I'm a, I'm all right with. I want. I think we're sold when pork. it comes to that. I I. You got to taste the pork. You used taste to be, the meat, not the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the old days in Muncie, you used to go to. Um, I think it was the Marsh Mar- Marsh or the uh, Marsh variety. They had different businesses they ran as hometown market. I don't remember what they are anymore. They're gone. They failed. Um, but you would go back to the deli counter and they would have those in there. And they were the a little. They weren't the tiny little nasty ones. They were. Oh yeah. Not nasty. That's that's too. Uh, they're not nasty. Yeah. No, they're just not. They're not as good as yeah. as what you do at home. So yeah. All right. So so that's the 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 animal production side. What mm-hmm. about what about GMOs? What do you want to know? Can you explain to me why why that's <laughs> not going to kill me? Because obviously, CIA, FBI, GMO, those are all letters that can kill you. Yeah. They can just assassinate. They or have the power dog. to kill. ATF or, or, or your, your dog. dog. Yeah. <laughs> So, so to calm me down off the ledge. Why, why should I not be afraid? Uh, again, it's just modern science. It's the way that we're handling. It's the way that we're handling problems as producers today. Um, GMOs, uh, people, you, you hear Franken food in the same way that you hear factory farm. Um, GMOs were produced to solve issues, natural issues that we have, um, and those range from natural droughts, uh, wet conditions, uh, bugs, you know, got corn borers and all kinds of different beetles and things that chew on, chew on crops that we're trying to produce. Um, and then there are chemicals that we can use to control weeds, which, uh, it makes the crop resistant to. So you can spray it over a certain crop and it won't hurt that crop, but it will kill the weeds that are around it. Um, these are just, uh, modern solutions to problems that we've had for a very long time with crop production. So how long have GMOs existed? Is this 20 years? Is this 60 years? Man, I wish I could, I wish I could tell you an exact uh, date, but I don't have that one right off the top of my head. I would say that we, that humans have been modifying the way that we grow our food for millennia. It's the gene gene editing though, is the part that's, that freaks people out because it's not, it's not done selectively. It's done too quickly. Mm-hmm. It's gone way too fast. And there's only a handful of products that actually are GMO. A lot of stuff gets marketed as, yeah. as GMO free. Yeah. Right? Again, I wish I had that list of, I'm, of, I'm going to effort that I, for us. Cause it's, it, it's, it's comical. Like it's, it's like, like six things. It's like 11, like eight, maybe eight or 11. Now I think alfalfa recently they, they put on that list. Just look up list of GMO foods. But again, um, as far as that technology goes, like I mentioned with, uh, Purina, uh, Dow AgriSciences a few years ago took us to their headquarters in Indianapolis and they showed us all the science of how they come up with products and GMOs uh, nowadays to solve some of our problems. And what people don't realize is to come up with these products, there's a typical 10 year pipeline oh, wow. of research and development. Holy cow. So these aren't things that we're saying, oh, we're going to. They're not just pumping them out. Yeah. We're going to splice this gene with this radioactive gene and make people eat it. It's there's actually a lot of research and development by scientists that's going into this and they're watching and testing basically every, every Avenue before it can ever be approved for, for our use. All right. So issues that we have today, um, say there's a certain weed that's resistant to some of these older chemicals that we've been using. Um, say we need a new, we need new chemistry to fight some of these resistant weeds. Uh, It might not be 10 years before we see an actual, a product on the market that we can use here are the, some of your chemicals are only good for certain weeds um, and other invasive species. Yes. And some, and it's kind of a guessing match, right? Whenever you're at the, when, whenever you're spraying your crops. Mm-hmm. So you usually know like, Oh, this area is bad for sunflowers. Mm-hmm. Right. But sometimes it, that's a miss. Yes. Because I'd, I, the only reason I know that I, whenever I worked um, for some local farmers, they had 
sunflowers that just all of a sudden appeared Mm -hmm. in a field. And it was like, we've never had sunflower a problem. Well, it's a bigger problem that we're dealing with now. We're dealing with water hemp and uh, Palmer amaranth. Uh, I thought hemp was illegal. Yeah. Well, (laughs) depends on where you're at again, but those volunteer crops get you every time. (laughs) But these, uh, these, these weeds have actually come out of the South and, uh, sometimes, um, it come, it, it can migrate up with uh, wind or birds. Some, sometimes birds can bring it up. Um, uh, other forms of, uh, the, they can truck manure up here where those animals have ate it and it's gone in the manure and then we're spread it out on fields up here. And you see, can that, buy a, That just proves to me that it really does matter yeah. what a cow eats Yeah, whenever I'm eating it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's your list of actual GMO products. Cade, you can, you can expand on these and tell me what you, they're actually used for and how it affect, it would affect us, if anything. Uh, corn. So mm-hmm. corn is the first one that comes up. Uh, the next one is canola, which I legitimately only, I'm sure it's used in other products, but canola oil is the thing that everybody thinks about. Mm-hmm. Um, Big in Canada. Modified for uh, herbicide. Yeah. Tolerance. So it's, it's there just simply to, to keep other plants from crowding it out. Basically mm-hmm. uh, soybeans, which everybody kind of knows, knows that one. And that's insects and, uh, and herbicide. Mm-hmm. Sugar beets. That's not a product that we have around here. Sugar beets are like North Dakota, Minnesota. Like you need to be in almost a colder climate Western for sugar yeah. beets, bears, battles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cooler, uh, cooler climates in the U S uh, pest and uh, virus resistance and as well as uh, herbicides, uh, papaya. So papaya mm-hmm. is one, uh, without the technology, it's claimed that, uh, the papaya ring spot virus would have completely eliminated papayas. So GMO uh, saved it. Uh, cotton. Cotton is a, a GMO product. So don't eat it, everybody. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's uh, protecting from the ball worm, uh, which uh, could have wiped it out. Bad news about apples or good news about apples. <laughs> um, some are uh, some apples are GMO. Arctic golden and Arctic granny. Uh won't go brown on you. Um, and allegedly uh, it's because they won't, uh, they, they won't go brown. So kids will like them better. Alfalfa is a, uh, is a GMO and it's for herb herbicide. So that's mm-hmm. basically to keep other weeds from growing up through it. Yep. Now alfalfa is primarily grown uh, for livestock production. Correct? Typically. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Is there any other reason that you would grow alfalfa? Uh, not me personally. I mean, yeah. I, animal agriculture, it's high, high protein feed, feed value. So hmm. it's good. What about squash? You, you eat a lot of squash? I, I do. do. Yeah. yeah. I love squash. I like squash. We do too. We roast it. I mean, more than anything else, we'll cut yeah. it up and we'll, we'll roast it in the, uh, you know, on a, on a pan. Yep. Usually yeah. as in mixed veggies or whatever. I like to, uh, throw it, wrap it in aluminum foil and throw some slices of butter in there with some herbs and then put it on right on the charcoals. Uh, yeah, it's so good. Viruses, uh, viruses will, uh, destroy 80% of, uh, squash crop every year. Wow. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. That that's is crazy. That's a bad business to get into. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then salmon. So that's a, that's an interesting one. <laughs> Aqua advantage salmon is the first genetically modified animal to be approved for consumption by the FDA. Uh, they grow faster. All right. So if you're going to bitch about one, <laughs> that might be the one that gets you to go. Oh man, that's uh, we got to figure out something with salmon and fish in general, just because of how much of it we eat. How much you know, though? Do you eat that much? We eat a ton. We're looking to the statistics of uh, overfishing our oceans, and it's absolutely horrifying. It's uh, one of those things where you read it and you go, "I never want to think about that again." <laughs> <laughs> Specifically because, you know, there's nothing that you or I can do about it. I mean, one guy stopping his fish consumption, like, what is that going to do? Most of our <laughs> fish from around here, like, it, it's farm fish anyway, so it's not a problem for us. But, you know. <sighs> I think another uh, big misconception is with the title of organic that they don't use any type of chemicals or pesticides yeah they're basically all the chemicals that you are allowed to produce your crops with they are cleared through the usda to still use and label themselves organic yeah, it's the it's the origin of the pesticides that they can use uh, which deems them 
still able to claim the title of organic. So a lot of ours are synthetic, man-made, and a lot of theirs are more natural. And more natural type ingredients, there are some synthetic that they, whenever, they have approved. I mean, if you look at the the chemical structure of the, the herbicides and the pesticides that you guys use, yeah, if it's man-made or if it's synthetic, it looks the same. Yeah. It's the same thing. But I think a lot of people, when they're at the grocery store and they see, you know, organic, they immediately yeah. think no it's pesticides. better for you. Yeah. 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 That's no what pesticides, they mean. no chemicals. Yeah. It might be, it might be the case, but With more some, times than not, it's not going to be the case. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think that a lot of that has to come down to, especially if you're talking about something that's natural mm-hmm. versus synthetic and man-made. There's just, there's a lot of confusion that surrounds, um, nutrition as a whole. Um, whenever you start looking at, yeah, this has so many, this food has so many grams of protein, but is that protein bioavailable? Are there branch chain amino acids that can make that protein usable for your body in this food? And there's, so there's a lot of nuance with those, um, topics. So then whenever, so people also think, well, this must also be a nuanced topic. Mm-hmm. A lot of times whenever you're talking about chemicals and the structure of chemicals like that, it's, it's not, Yeah, they're the same. That's mm-hmm. just one happens to be, but it's just the, it's, uh, most people are just naive to these differences and that's what the marketing targets. It just, yeah. the way that things are labeled, it just targets people that don't know any better that want to do what's best. They want to buy the best food that they can buy for their family. Um, and those, those typically target the, the labels typically target those people. I mean, back to animal agriculture, you see, uh, packages of chicken that say, you know, no hormones. Right. Or there's never, we've never been able to give chickens any type of hormones or anything like that. You see, um, no antibiotics, antibiotics. There, there's yeah. not, there's not allowed to be any of that in, in animal production that makes it to, you know, the market that has any of that. A lot of the products that we use that are antibiotics, um, it's to help animals that are sick and they, we have to follow a withdrawal period before we can allow that animal to go to a market. The, and there are penalties if you don't, if you don't follow the guidelines. The last one that, uh, that I skipped over was a potato. Yes. The innate potato. Which, uh, and, you know, I actually watched a video on YouTube that uh, from the, the folks that make uh, things you should know. They also do a podcast. They talked about the um, GMO potatoes, and that was specifically led and mainly funded by McDonald's because mm-hmm. the McDonald's is so uh, stringent and picky about the quality of the potatoes that they use Before for their French, French fries. fries. Yeah, yeah. So they really led the industry in developing something this that would work for them. Potato that is. Long, it didn't and skinny. Take, uh, it doesn't have reds government, in it. Government research. It just took people wanting cheap, good French fries. Yeah, so it, it they're longer, or cheap and consistent French yeah. fries. <laughs> they're longer, fatter potatoes. They don't have as many divots in them. Wow, and they also don't get bruised as easily. Hmm. Yeah. All right. I thought for some reason there was also rice. Is there no rice on that list? Not that I thought uh, there was a golden rice that was somewhat higher in a certain vitamin. They were using in Asian countries for vitamin deficiencies. Why does that have to be Asian countries? I don't. It's just what happens. Because I ate a lot more rice over there than we do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say it was a, called a golden rice. If we're going to eat grains, we're going to eat bread. Dang it. I could be wrong. <laughs> or it could be something somewhat related. Um. Yeah, there's... Golden a, rice. Yep. Sure. Genetically modified... Biofortified crops. This is uh, so we're actually using that technology to help solve uh, vitamin deficiencies, and I, I want to say that vitamin deficiency, whatever it is, might lead to blindness. Uh, dealing with malnutrition in developing countries. Yeah, it's a it's a project. Yeah. So this is actually yeah, this is actually it looks like um, it's really a pretty current debate. Yeah, there are risks. Do you want to know the risks of golden rice? <laughs> <laughs> Very, they say they're very minimal, but they say they are still discussed in popular discourse. Yeah, because I didn't know I was this old. About these I didn't yeah. know I was this old until I tried to read the Golden Rice article online, <laughs> <clears throat> and I had to go up to uh, senior print font here. <laughs> it's uh, it's an NYU study that I'm that I'm uh, that I'm attempting to read here on the fly. 
Um, so this is something happening right on the cusp of. Yeah, this is, it's something we are similar. On the tip of the spear. It's something similar to like what we've done with um, the iodine. Iodine in the uh, salt, table salt, yeah, for uh, deficiencies within the United States. Uh, I think it's something similar that they're doing with this rice because a lot of um, developing nations grow and consume a lot of rice because it's very nutrient dense already. Uh, yeah, as a food. And, and you're exactly right, Kate. They're adding, uh, trying to put uh, beta carotene in it. Uh, which is not normally produced in yeah. rice, yeah. Uh, but the beta carotene turns into vitamin A when metabolized by the human body, uh, which gives you healthier skin, immune system improvements, and vision. Yep. Um, so that's exactly what they're they're trying to get done. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah. We couldn't feed the world without GMO crops. Yep. It's just again, it comes back to sustainability. What can we grow on an acre of land with the technology that we have available to us versus what what can we grow on? That's a good, that's probably a good place for us to wrap up. You basically, the, the situation that the world has, um, and the Seven burden and that, a half billion people, the burden we place on farmers mm-hmm. is we give you less farm ground. Uh, we try to control you and more. we're less than 2% of the population and, now, and we farmers. try to get you to feed more of us. Yep. Right. Yep. And we're not particularly thankful. <laughs> Move out of not, my way. Not get out of the, the way. Yeah. You're, you're slowing me down. Machinery's in the way. Yeah. And honestly, so if you're, if you're here in Indiana, you feel like, oh my God, there's, there's farm fields everywhere, right? It's constant. It's everywhere you look. But if you travel the country, you realize that there are states where there's, yes, there's agriculture, but it's not as overwhelming. It is mm-hmm. as Ohio, Indiana, you know, even Michigan, Illinois, Iowa. You know, if you go down into Kentucky, all of a sudden you don't see cornfields everywhere. You don't yeah. see soybean fields everywhere. You get down in Tennessee. Uh, there, yes, there's agriculture, but it's not the complete saturation of, of a community or, or of a state like we have here. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say, I don't know, what is it? Probably 60% of the ground in, in Indiana is probably agriculture. Yeah. Uh, if you take out the national forests and the cities and, and, and the, the small amount of water that we have, the rest is agriculture. That's per, the un, undeveloped ground. That's generally what happens mm-hmm. unless it's protected as a park or a forest or something. Um, yeah. yeah. You've got limited, uh, You've got limited resources sure. and, and right here where we live, this is um, some of the most productive ground available for, to do what you do. Yeah. You know, if you go 50 to 60 miles South of us, all of a sudden you start to see people having to, uh, having to bring center pivots in and irrigation. Yep. You know, if you go down to Bartholomew County, it's, it's a different environment than you have right here in East central Indiana. Mm-hmm. Um, so consider yourself blessed to, <laughs> to, to be farming where you are. Right. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that's probably where uh, where we should we should end this episode. Is there anything else we skipped out on, Cade? That uh, no, I cover? think I would just wrap up with you know, like I said at the beginning, it's it's hardly ever a good food versus bad food argument. Um, just kind of have an informed opinion on what you're buying at the store. Uh, labels aren't always telling you exactly what you need to know. Um, the, really, the best option that you have is to find somebody local. Um, even sometimes I know through us, it's kind of seasonally with the produce, but, uh, we've got beef year round now, so you can come to us if you're okay. looking to buy any kind of beef. If I want shrimp, <laughs> should I insist that I get shrimp that came from the ocean that was, uh, off of the United States or is it okay if it came through China? Cause it's the same damn ocean. It all connects together. Yeah. They all, does it matter? Am I, am I at risk if I buy shrimp I just, that started I, in Taiwan or China? I, I, see, I would be in the same boat because I don't really have any knowledge on that one. Right. So, I mean, if it's something you can research while you're in He's the store, do it. a cow farmer, it. not a shrimp farmer. Well, this, is what, this is what I'm saying, though. Is it's, a, it's, a, it's another it one might, of those products. It might just come down to what you can where, afford. Where, so, the label says that it came from Taiwan, and man, I'm uncomfortable because it comes from Taiwan, and they look different than I do. The shrimp I ate today so was I, Argentinian. I, so, I, I insist on <laughs> shrimp that comes from, <laughs> comes from my country, right? I... I, I yeah, it's it's your responsibility. You can put anything on yeah. a label, but it's your responsibility to understand what that means exactly, and if it matters to you or not. Yep, you've got that much information, and now it's it's your burden as a consumer to figure it out. And if if you can buy local, if you if you if you can't, ed, try to educate yourself a little bit on what you can find. If you have questions about any type of local agriculture, animal or grain farming, um, absolutely feel free to message me. I'll do my very best to answer you or at the very least, point you in the right direction for, for a good answer. So jump on bosshogofliberty.com. Cade's contact info is there. You can uh, He's tagged in almost everything. You go to the <laughs> website. Every episode Cade's ever been on is there. Yep. Uh, and then uh, you can follow him on the Snapchat at Cade, you're at Cade Coger on every platform, right? 
Uh, the uh, armed farmer. The oh, armed farmer on the, on, on the on IG. Instagram, yeah. All right. What's your TikTok? You got one of those yet? Nope, I'm refusing that one. <laughs> you could go viral. The we Chinese, don't know. I'm not going yeah. over there. The the federal government classified TikTok <laughs> as a cybersecurity threat. Yeah, I am not getting that. <laughs> not doing it. All right, Dakota, you got anything else for Cade? I have nothing. Just stay off TikTok, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Boss Hog of Liberty, which is part of the We Are Libertarians network. I am Chris Spangle, and I am the founder of this network. And I invite you to listen to all of our shows, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com or by searching for these in your podcatcher. The flagship show is the We Are Libertarians podcast, where we apply libertarian principles to current events. The Brian Nichols Show is a conversation amongst Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, as they talk about what is happening in the news. And we have many other podcasts like The Chris Spangle Show, Upward, The Cost, Raw Audio Politics, Miranda's World, and Tad Talk, which is quite a ride. So check all of these out. Go to WeAreLibertarians.com and you can check out all of our great podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Get our other shows at WeAreLibertarians.com.